Okay. Uh, this is a re-recording of uh, an Emerald, Comp um, Emerald Conference 2020 uh, presentation that I gave at an at Agilent seminar. Um, so this is a topic that's going to cover um, a, a broad uh, array of information regarding the cannabis genome. So there is some work here related to a preprint that we just published. Uh, we're going to go over some of that. There's also some work here that's not in the preprint um, that describes how to potentially um, breed for particular hemp genetics. Okay, so right now there are some USDA regs out there and um, they're pretty challenging to, to address right now because they're very strict in terms of levels of THC. Um, and we're, we're finding that THC and THCA can be leaking from a lot of other cannabinoid synthase genes. And we're going to try and address how to track those genetically um, and what implications that has for pathogen response because eliminating some of these genes means you eliminate some neighboring genes which happen to be uh, pathogen response genes and some some of the cannabinoid genes we're going to touch on that um, but um, to give you some um, some backstory here this actually uh, was a project that started um, a long time ago a couple years ago June uh, 2018 actually we started this with uh, with a grant that we received for cryptocurrency and it actually was snowballed by a, uh, a foundation medicine sequencing report for my father. Uh, and I explained some of this at a, uh, at a PAC bio seminar at, at PAG uh, back in January uh, when we're going through a, a bioinformatics seminar there. Um, there's a, probably a recording of that floating around as well. Um, but uh, we had a sense of urgency to this because this foundation medicine report was actually a mutation of a tumor from my father. Uh, it was a prostate cancer that they biopsied. They sequenced the biopsy and found that he, did, he had a BRAF K601E variant. Um, that's an amino acid position in the BRAF gene. And when you have that type of mutation, they recommend AKT inhibitors. Um, there weren't any AKT inhibitors that Foundation Medicine was confident with. Um, of course, we Googled AKT inhibitors and cannabinoids, and up comes all types of hits on how cannabinoids are, um, are potent. Uh, AKT inhibitors. And our father was interested in using those anyway due to the fact that they were addressing the nausea and the bone pain that nothing else seemed to touch. So um, so we had a sense of urgency on this project um, and that urgency was underscored in the manner in which we uh, funded this. This is one reason why we truncate the, the, this long title uh, into a uh, speedweed as being a, an abbreviated version of all of this uh, scientific mumbo jumbo what we have here in the title. But uh, knowing we couldn't jump to NIH to get funding this quickly, um, we turn to a cryptocurrency known as Dash. Uh, Dash is a fork of Bitcoin, technically a fork of Litecoin, which, which uh, forked up a Bitcoin, but uh, nevertheless, its code base is very similar. Uh, the only thing they changed is they decided to create a treasury so that as the cryptocurrency grew and they issued more of these coins uh, to the miners, they could reserve some of those coins into a treasury that people could vote on uh, as to how to distribute those coins. Now, who votes? Well. Um, there's another set of master node owners in the network that if you hold a thousand of these dash in as a proof of stake of your ownership in the network, you get a dividend of, um, I shouldn't say dividend, you get, you get, you get the ability to vote on, on these actual, uh, how you use this treasury. So the master nodes are responsible for helping distribute some of the coins and making sure that the, the instasend works and they, and they, they have to keep up a node that's fully functional and fast that can relay uh, messages or, or transactions very quickly. Um, so the, the, the master node owners get some of the rewards, of the block rewards, the miners get some of the block rewards, and then there's a treasury, and only the master node owners can um, vote on the treasury. They have to have at least a thousand dash piece. Anyway, long complicated story. This cryptocurrency is interested in solving banking problems in very various jurisdictions in the world, and one of the markets they're interested in is cannabis, and they figured having a really good cannabis reference is going to help with seed to sale tracking, and it's going to help with uh, building a good uh, blockchain for that industry. So they funded this. Um, the crazy thing about getting crypto funded by Dash is that every month your funding can disappear. Um, so we were granted a five month um, grant. Uh, it was probably roughly in the seventy or eighty thousand dollar range, but the currency is so volatile it probably ended up being about a third of that by the time the project was over. We we actually were funded a time period where the cryptocurrencies were going down quite a bit. So every single month we had to refactor our plan as to how we're going to sequence this thing because the currency would change on us. And there's one month we nearly got voted off. Um, so uh, it does it does change the pace of science, and you can see some of this stuff that's been posted. Um, on the page is a cryptocurrency funded genomics page of Mystical Genomics that will talk you, you know, walk you through how this project progressed. And every every single experiment has been logged, and every single experiment, negative experiment, is up there as well. So all your embarrassments are, are, are online. 
Um, okay, so how do you get this published in five months? Well, it's really hard to. So what we did uh, is we put it up on a preprint server uh, and then invited people on the internet to review it. We put out a bounty, a $500 bounty um, for three reviewers to, to be selected based on their credentials. We put their credentials online so everyone can see that they're not, uh, they're not our friends. Um, and uh, $500 upon completion if they completed the review in seven days. All of them completed the review in seven days, right? So this is a really fast way to get a review done. Some people call it bribing. Uh, we don't think so. We think there should actually be a price signal in peer review so that a market can develop and that really good reviewers will get paid more than bad reviewers and that it would become a, uh, you know, almost a, an industry or market for some people. So, um, uh, you know, stipends like this actually give people priority to work on these things. And one of the reasons peer review is broken is that no one has a priority to do it well or to necessarily do it quickly. It's all done on, on charity right now. So uh, this is a way to, to cut out some of the journals and just do preprints and, and, and bounties. But nevertheless, it's controversial and we weren't going to end there. We just couldn't get this thing through a normal peer review process, let alone get the genome sequence in, in, in a five month time frame. So we opted to do this approach and we have since followed up with the more traditional approach where we're taking that data and of course 42 more genomes and putting it through bioarchive and uh, in the traditional peer review process. So, okay, there's a lot more data in this and this is the data that we're going to go over in this presentation. Uh, this, this, this actually represents an entire trio that we sequence. A trio is a sibling, a, a set of parents and their offspring, okay? So mother, father, offspring. In this case, the mother and the father happen to be brothers, so it's an inbred trio, and the offspring is, uh, happens to be a male, and it uh, ends up being, I think the offspring in this case is type three male. Um, so um, with that, uh, we've got five tissues of isoseq also done on, on the Jamaican lion mother. Okay, the, 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 the strain that we're sequencing here, the cultivar, however you want to call it, is a uh, is Jamaican lion. Uh, the tissues um, that we're sequencing with isoseq, um, this is important to sequence RNA. In order for you to, to annotate the genome, you want to sequence the RNA from multiple tissues, okay? Now, we chose to take approach using single molecule sequencing to read that RNA because single molecule sequencing reads the entire RNA piece in one go. Uh, you're not trying to assemble the answer of the transcript with a bunch of short reads. You just get one long read that goes across the entire RNA. And in fact, the reads are so long now, they lap the RNA multiple times. Um, they turn these RNA molecules into circles and the sequencer reads it like a gerbil on a wheel over and over again until it gets it right. Um, so the best annotations in the world are done with isoseq right now. All right, that's the method of choice to annotate a plant genome. So we did it across five tissues. We did four tissues with um, a methylseq program or, 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 or protocol known as emseq from New England Biolabs. Uh, we then did 40 whole genome shotgun libraries on Illumina. These ones were um, barely amplified. I and mean, the reason we took very care, um, exquisite care, to keep low numbers of amplification cycles in these libraries is because we want to look at copy number variation. And if you start PCRing your libraries before sequencing, you lose resolution on copy number uh, analysis. And we didn't want to do that. So all of these libraries have 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 um, UMIs on them, which are which are these uh, these ind indices, almost like a DNA barcode that's put on so that you can do um, you can do molecule counting and and detect PCR amplification bias. Uh, and you can also remove it. But you'll see in the in the paper, we didn't actually even need to use the UMIs. Just by using three cycles of PCR, there's very, very uniform um, coverage across the genome. Uh, and we know that because we compare the coverage of this Illumina method to what we have from PacBio, which has almost no coverage bias. Uh, we have done some phase genomics work and some ONT. Um, not, we're not going to touch on much of that in this presentation. We'll save that for a later one. That's a more complicated topic. Uh, all in all, this represents about four terabases of sequence. It's an NCBI. It's 40 times larger than any other cannabis submission that we can find. I'm certain that that, that landmark number is going to change in time as I've seen a lot of um, data getting queued up to go into NCBI. But nevertheless, it's a very large uh, change in the landscape of, of cannabis sequence information that's now public. Um, this is now public in the Koji Genome Browser. Uh, it's also public in NCBI. And you can read this uh, paper here at BioArchive. This is what we're going to be touching on. Okay, so a little bit about terminology. All right, so when you're sequencing genomes, um, there's a couple techniques that you can use, but there's three in general that you probably heard the most about. You've probably heard about Illumina, often often um, abbreviated as ILMN. 
Pox or Nanopore, and there's uh, there's a couple of different flavors of Pack Bio. There's Pack Bio Continuous Long Read, which is running the molecule as long as you can, not lapping it at all, and you have uh, it, a much higher air rate that way. And then there's PB uh, or Pack Bio CCS, which is a circular consensus sequencing. That's the gerbil wheel. That's when you run it over and over again and get really high accuracy. Um, and only recently could they do this on 20 kb molecules and we're going to touch on some of that most recent data toward the end of this uh, that's what's known as hi-fi sequencing the graph here on the left is just demonstrating which techniques give give you the most accurate genomes and that's pb ccs hands down this is the gold standard nothing touches it there's there's exciting work coming out of, a, of oxford anapore and illumina but um, they don't have the accuracy yet and so they can be a bit challenging for assembling plant genomes um, they can help scaffold, though. They may, they may play a role in, in scaffolding some of the, the, uh, the, uh, the contents together. Um, okay, we're going to touch on a few of those things uh, going forward. Okay, so here are the, the methylation maps and the messenger RNA maps were done for these five tissues. Uh, the roots didn't seem to want to cooperate with us for the methylation map, but we did manage to get some RNA out of the roots for, for sequencing. Um, and a couple, you know, interesting stories. Here's the adestin um, gene that you can see across multiple different tissues having different methylation patterns. And this makes sense because the adestin gene gets turned on when you make seeds. This is the protein that makes hemp seeds so nutritious. This is the protein we need to understand if we want to feed the world. Uh, this is a really important gene in cannabis uh, that you barely hear spoken about. Um, but uh, you can see we have RNA Transcript differences over here um, that are tissue specific, and we also have different methylation patterns. And uh, why do we care? Well, methylation is uh, a sign that genes are getting turned off. When things are hypomethylated or red, when they, um, sorry, hypermethylated when they're red, hyper meaning having lots of uh, methylation patterns, it silences transcription and then you don't get RNA out of it. Uh, when um, things are unmethylated, it begins to turn on transcription and you end up getting RNA off of it. So methylation is involved in turning genes on and off. And so it's always good to see correlations between the methylation patterns and the promoters of genes and the RNA transcription that's coming off of it. Okay, so a bit about RNA. So we take these molecules of RNA and we clone them into a circle or we put what are known as smart bells on them, which makes a double-stranded DNA and then you put smart bells or DNA loops in the end of it. So when the polymerase latches on with the primer, it starts lapping this molecule, peeling it apart and running around and around in a circle. This is known as circular consensus sequencing. And the RNA molecules are getting 50 to 100 laps now. This is run in the sequencer that had remarkable read lengths. And as a result, we could lap these things so many times that we're getting Q30, Q40 uh, DNA. That means DNA sequence that has one a thousand, one in a 10,000 error rate. Um, here's the size of the of the RNA that we got out of tissues, um, and then you can see the the number of um, of genes that were discovered in the process. What we, we call these high quality isoforms. Um, so any given gene can actually make multiple isoforms because genes um, have introns and exons, and those can get shuffled in various ways when it makes an RNA. The RNA can choose to read every single exon in the gene. And then afterwards, it may get spliced by the cell where it rips a couple exons out or skips a couple exons and shuffles them around. But that all happens in splicing the RNA. So when you start reading RNA molecules, you see all of the isoforms from a given gene. And on average, there's probably about three isoforms per gene. Um, this is just demonstrating that uh, if you look at this curve here, based on the number of isoforms, the number of reads, as we sequence more reads, we begin to saturate the isoform discovery. But you will notice that this is not yet saturated from any tissues. So I would expect if we double down on sequencing here or sequence some more tissues, we'll discover more genes than what we're going to describe here. But this is one of the first surveys. Um, so the female genomes had over 27,000 genes. The exome's larger than human. That's up at 40, almost 44 megabase exome. Um, the exome includes un, uh, UTRs, which are basically uh, untranslated regions. These are regions that inc include the promoter and can include some of the terminators on, on the genes. And then all the exons that actually code for stuff from the first methionine to the last start and stop codon are known as CDS. Those are coding sequences, all right? So the exome includes the UTRs and um, the coding sequence it only includes the, um, the internal exons, all right? Now this stuff is um, scattered or defragmented all over um, the cannabis genome, if you will, across 121 megabases. So very large introns as well. The genes are, are, are easily disrupted with structural variation. Keith Allen published some work, encourage people to look at this. This is looking at a bunch of the terpene synthase genes in Jamaican lion, and you can see the different families that are out there, the family A, B, and C terpene synthase genes, and the fact that they um, seem to have long 
introns in all of the family genes. There isn't one particular gene family that has longer um, introns than the other. And he's correlated this with some of the chemical data that they're seeing at Steep Hill. Okay, now the male is very interesting because the male is bigger. The male has another 100 megabase. It's a tire, an, an entirely new chromosome, the Y chromosome, um, that the females do not have. Uh, and as a result of this, we're seeing about 4,444 male-specific genes that brings the male gene model in this plan up to 32,000 genes. Uh, and about 80 megabases of this is Y-specific, and about 30 megabases is what's known as pseudoautosomal Y. The pseudoautosomal region of Y still crosses over with the X, so the genes that are on the Y that can still cross over with the X are important because those are traits, male-based traits, that can make their way uh, in, in, into, into the X chromosome. All right, now the, the, the Y-specific sequence are if the genes on that section, well, it's not going to, it's, it's unlikely you're going to find it uh, breeding into your population unless you're keeping males around. All right. Now, how do you assess whether these genomes are done? Well, the best peer review is actually other people utilizing this data in publications. And you saw that with Keith's work. And, you see, and there's another paper here from the Orsborn Laboratory that actually ran mass spec, not on Jamaican line, uh, even though this, this image up here makes you think they ran on Jamaican line. What they did is they got MS spectra of peptides off of the plants that they worked on and then they mapped those peptide sequences to the Jamaican lion reference and they're finding Jamaican lion to have the most complete reference. Uh, we know that from just looking at the assembly statistics. We're going to go over that in a little bit uh, as to what assembly statistics do you look at in order to evaluate the, um, the completeness of genome. But the other thing you can do is you can do an intersection, which is what we've been showing down here in this Venn diagram, which is that 98.8% of the mass spec data we find corresponding homes for those in this DNA sequence information in the Jamaican lion genome. Um, now, they discovered 12,000 peptides. This is probably the first time they did it. I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if that number rises in time as they dial up the sensitivity of the instrument or, or survey different tissues. Um, so they're only seeing about 40% of the peptides that we see throughout the entire genome, but that's actually pretty good. When you think about how many genes are actually expressed in any given tissue, it's rarely more than that. So they're probably capturing every gene that's present in the tissues they surveyed. And if they survey more tissues, their number will probably soon match what we see complete in the, in the um, Jamaican lion genome. Uh, mass spec data brings other information. It brings glycosylation signals that we don't have in the RNA data. So, so it's an important tool to um, complement the data that we've got. Um, okay. Uh, that being said, uh, it, the, the RNA data is probably more sensitive. Um, it is, we can get single molecules of RNA sequence very readily, and I'm not as uh, familiar with the sensitivities in the mass spec, but I, I'd be, I imagine it'd be challenging to get down to single molecule levels with the complexity of the entire proteome, but maybe that's possible. Okay. Um, so how do we start decorating these chromosomes? We don't really have chromosomes right now. We have an assembly that has, um, contigs, which are just basically long contiguous stretches of sequence. And of course, those contigs are usually going to break when you hit the centromeres of the genome and the telomeres, because those are the ends of the chromosomes in the middle. Um, sometimes, if you're really good at this, you can get through the centromeres. They're just now getting through the centromeres on the human genome after, I don't know, 10, how many years is that now? 20 years of trying to finish it. So um, only recently have there been tools to do tip to tip or telomere to telomere assemblies. And we're starting to do that with Jamaican line. Okay, so decorating um, the male. Let's figure out what the Y is. What you do is you take the male flower RNA, those isosec reads, you map them to the female reference, right? And then the reads that don't stick to that reference, you map back to the male. That decorates the regions of the male genome that are unique to the male and have no home in the female. This is probably that part of the Y chromosome you might be seeing down here, which doesn't cross over with X anymore. This region up here, the top part of it, the smaller part is believed to still cross over with X. This one, if we want to decorate it, um, this is what we do. And this gives us the information that is down here. Um, and when we do this, uh, we find regions of DNA that uh, amount to about the size of a chromosome, 65 contigs, uh, and one of the largest contigs in the genome. There's about 427 BUSCO genes in here, which is interesting. So BUSCO is a tool that we use to measure the completeness of genomes. Uh, and it's, um, it's, there's around, uh, there's just over 2,000 genes in the Busco data set that sh they believe should exist in all plants. And you want to find, a, you know, over 90% of those. In fact, Jamaican Lion's finding around 97% uh, of those genes are in the Jamaican Lion reference. And that gives you a sense as to how complete the genome is, okay? 
Um, but some of those are on the Y, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, unclear whether they're duplicates or not. They might have counterparts in other parts of the genome, but that's, um, that's uh, something to know. Uh, now, the other thing to take note of is this process isn't perfect, right? There could be structural variants that are novel in the male genome that aren't male specific. They're just not in the female, but they're on one of the autosomes. And we'll, we'll touch on a few of those. And those would make it through this process, all right? So this, this is a combination of both what is male specifically expressed and also any novel structural variations, particularly inserts that could be in the male genome that would make its way through this that aren't in the female, all right? And we have a way to solve that. The way to solve that is with a whole lot of whole genome shotgun sequencing, which we will show, so we'll touch on in a bit. Okay, so let's back up and talk about uh, how you build reference grade genomes. Well, uh, the best tools today are using Pacific Biosciences tools. Um, there's also some Oxford Nanopore material working out there. Uh, we're not fond of it at the moment because of its error rate, and the cannabis genome being so repetitive makes it really expensive and challenging to assemble genomes with its error rate. Uh, there are attempts to try and polish that error rate with Illumina. We have found that to be somewhat faulty uh, just due to the fact that uh, you really can't error correct ONT data in regions that aren't mappable with Illumina. Uh, you get too, much, too many reads that pile up in that region, and you don't really know where they came from, and so your error correction is really a mirage. So we stick with the highest quality long reads we can get, and that's with PacBio. Um, so here's the dash-funded female genome. Uh, this was then crossed with a male. Um, this offspring was actually selected. I'm sorry, it was a female. Uh, this offspring was selected because it was a runt. Uh, we were interested in genes or deletions that might impact yield, and so we selected one of the offspring that uh, looked like it was having trouble growing and turned out to be a real stubborn run with hyper, hyper branching and whatnot. Okay, so we did we did tons of sequencing. For those who don't know, this is like 200x coverage of, of one of these genomes. This is 150x coverage of these genomes, right? We absolutely hammered these things with more sequence coverage than you would ever need for a couple reasons. One, we didn't really know how big the genome was gonna be. Most other genome projects to date were still below the one megabase and 50 number, which meant they were broken and not quite mature. Most of the DNA assembling people out there in the world want to see one megabase or greater in 50s to call it in the megabase club, and we're pushing up to three and beyond. Uh, you'll see some later data pushing up to five and eight. Um, now, this is really the most important metric, is how long these contigs are, how deep they've been covered, and with what accuracy you have in the raw data. Because this is the information you're going to look for single nucleotide changes in that are going to make an impact on protein function and make an impact on evolution. We measure almost all of the selective pressure by looking at these, these changes in SNPs, and you want those to be extraordinarily accurate. Uh, and the longer this gets and the better these BUSCO scores get, um, that's a sign that you're coming to completion on the genome and that you're doing it with, um, uh, with the largest number of uh, the most contiguous genome that you can put together. Now, there are some other genomes out there that have 750 uh, KB and 50, and they've tried to glue some of those uh, contigs in order and orient them into a scaffold by using some linkage information in breeding, and that's an interesting approach. Um, the, the only challenge is the linkage information that people are, are utilizing is coming from the Illumina sequencer, which has really short reads, and the reads don't always map very effectively. And so there is some confusion over what the chromosome names are right now in, in NCBI, and, and we're hoping we'll be able to address that with some of the data we have here. Okay, so in addition to doing that trio with PacBio, we then busted out an Illumina sequencer and, uh, and sequenced another 40 genomes. And in that 40 genomes was the rest of the family. Okay, so uh, one of these, JL number five, which turned out to be the runt of all these, uh, was sequenced with PacBio. The rest of these, well, it was, and also got resequenced with Illumina. Now, what you're looking at here, uh, we've described in our Canopedia tutorial. This is the sequence coverage over certain genes in the genome. Type 2 plants have coverage across all of them. Type 3 only have coverage over CBD synthase. Uh, we don't have any type 1s in here. We have mostly type 2s and type 3s, okay? Type 1s would have only um, coverage over THC synthase. All right, we also did an outcross. Um, so we've got some sequencing information on, on not just sequencing uh, a cross between an inbred pair, but we also outbred it to blueberry cheesecake, and uh, we have some of the offspring of those as well. So uh, an interesting tree. Okay, so now if you look at the 40 genomes we sequenced and you take those Illumina reads and you map them against the maternal reference here, you can see uh, the number of SNPs that we're seeing compared to the Jamaican lion reference. 
So we're getting, you can see the number of SNPs up here is in the, in the 12 to 14,000 range. This axis of the insertions and deletions, they're highly concordant with the actual single nucleotide changes. And you'll notice all these type ones are, you know, about 10, 12, maybe 16 million SNPs apart. Uh, but when you get into the Jamaican lion family, it tends to dip. Uh, and that's because these are all closely related. So, of course, they have more similar genomes to their parents than they do to anything else. And so these map out of really, really um, producing very few SNPs. Um, all in all, we ended up with about 58 million variants in here. Um, these are all mapped with Dragon and Parabricks, two different tools for doing um, hardware acceleration for sequencing mapping. Um, and uh, we kept these all down below five cycles of PCR, with, uh, uh, as we mentioned before. So when you have those PCR cycles done at a really low um, number of cycles, you can count on the coverage information in the sequencing to give you patterns of, uh, of deletions and, um, and insertions, what we call copy number variations, or CNVs. And what you're looking at here is a collection of all the cannabinoid synthase genes. I'm not going to say all, but the ones that we've curated to believe matter. Um, and, uh, and of course, these are all the ones we found in the reference, the Jamaican lion reference, okay? If you do another reference like CBDRX or Purple Kush, they might have other cannabinoid synthase genes we don't have, right? I mean, just take a look at this map. You'd be a fool not to think that because even looking at this through the lens of Jamaican lion, all these blue areas are, are lines, cannabis varietals that have deletions in certain core genes that are certain cannabinoid synthase genes. So all this blue space you see is just gone cannabinoid synthase genes that aren't in those genomes. The red ones have two copies, and, the, and the, the, the purple stuff are haploid there. They have like a single copy, okay? So their mother genome might have the deletion there, but their father genome has it. So you can see there's a tremendous amount of copy number change here over these genes, and so we'd be a little bit naive to think that if we surveyed other cannabis genomes, that there might not be a longer set of these genes that the Jamaican lion genome is actually missing a few that we don't know about. All right? This is the reason why we believe it's important to do a pan genome because when you view all these genomes through a single lens of Jamaican lion, you're only going to see all the genes that are in Jamaican lion in, in the other genomes, but you're not going to see the gene content that is novel to the other genomes that Jamaican lion doesn't have. Okay, And that's a very big number is what we're anticipating, and, and uh, we'll show you that in a slide or two forward when we look at structural variations, which are a similar form of variation. Um, okay, on the right-hand side are 82 different genes involved in pathogen response. These are chitinases, thalmatine-like proteins, or TLPs, you'll hear us call them for short, and then MLO, which is a mildew lo lo loci that's been tracked down in hops. Why did we pick these? Well, these are just genes in the literature that we, um, families of genes in the literature that we know have been tied to powdery mildew resistance in hops. And we did have some powdery mildew resistance information from a couple of the growers. The green lines down here are powdery mildew resistant, and the pink ones aren't. And of course, what do you see as uh, in a heat map like this? You get a little bit of a correlation that all the samples over here seem to have a pattern that's different than the ones over here, and maybe that is what is driving powdery mildew resistance in these. So um, it's a whim. Uh, it could be that all of these samples are Jamaican lion. Not all of them, but a lot of them are, and that they just happen to have a shared ancestry, and that this pattern of different TLPs and MLOs is just an artifact of their ancestry and has nothing to do with resistance. Well, what was really interesting to us is that a few of these samples that proven to be extraordinarily powdery mildew resistant and aren't related to Jamaican lion uh, have a copy number amplification uh, on some chitinases. And likewise, there is a thalmatine-like protein um, that has been amplified in these as well. And uh, I can't see this very clearly here, but we'll show you which one that is going forward. But we took a couple of these genes that were amplified uh, and seemed to have, a, have the most extreme copy number um, changes and cloned them. And the way you do this is you run a PCA analysis. I don't have the PCA in here, but if you run a PCA analysis on this, the genes that stick out as having the most signature in the PCA analysis are what we chose to clone and, 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 and to express. Um, now, you also want to look upstream, right? So the cannabinoid precursor genes are probably playing a role, role in the magnitude of cannabinoids. They, they're not going to dictate whether you make CBD or THC, but that might dictate how much you make. And there have been previous copy number amplifications that have been described by John Page on AEA1. And we might have some of that here in this, in this if I read this correctly. 
And there's a couple other ones that have deletions. So we're keeping an eye on some of the precursors that may be involved in um, uh, in modulating the amount of cannabinoids. And the other thing we're looking at are the, are the, the trichome by refringement genes, which um, may be playing a role in trichome development, shape, or size. But we don't know. We're just kind of looking for uh, there's a lot of consistency in here in this part. But then you get down here, and some of these genes look like they might be differentially modulated um, or have different copy number and maybe playing a role in trichomes. Um, so there's a, there's just a really rich set of information here, uh, and we by no means have we thoroughly mined this data set. We've put it public because we think having millions of eyes look at this is going to be more productive than having it rust between our own servers. Um, so um, that being said, we did we did comb through the RNA data um, to try and hunt down what uh, which of these genes should we clone. I mentioned before we did a PCA analysis that 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 populated a couple candidates. After we had those candidate genes, we asked the same question as well: Are those same candidate genes that the PCA pulled out from a copy number standpoint in the genome, do they also have a lot of RNA being expressed? So these are the cannabinoid synthase genes. These are the different tissues. And you can see that we do have, um, we have some expression, but it is pretty much zeroed in on uh, having expression that is uh, tissue specific for only a couple of the genes. In fact, the cannabichromine genes seem to only be expressed, at least in this Jamaican lion plant and in the males. That may not be true in other plants. I've heard of cannabichromine getting expressed in female flowers, but it's just not the case with Jamaican lion, uh, at least the time point we, we harvested the, these, uh, this RNA. You look down here at the actual chitinases, the TLOs, uh, or the TLPs and the MLOs, and you see a much different picture. Uh, a handful of genes here that just don't care, they're not on at all, but you get down here and there are some heavily expressed genes. In fact, the most heavily differentially expressed gene in the genome are the chitinases. Uh, that was a red, a red flag to us. In fact, they're not expressed in the roots at all. And we think that's because the roots want to communicate with the rhizal, with, with the mycorrhizal uh, and, and the fungi environment in underneath the, the soil. It doesn't want to use chitinases that destroy microbes that could be doing nitrogen fixation for it. However, everywhere else on the plant, it's expressing chitinases galore. Uh, and uh, we just confirmed some of this RNA sequencing information with some of the methylation information to zero in on which one of these chitinases we're going to clone. And this is the one that got cloned and is sitting on plates with fusarium as we speak. Um, there's some methylation patterns in here that um, we were um, combing over. This is what they look like actually when you bring them up in an IGV read viewer or genome browser as you see all of these blue regions and these red regions that are being silenced. Okay, so now that we have these enzymes, uh, these targets, the genome, what do you do? You take that gene, you clone it into a coli, and you express it. Uh, and you get the coli to make lots of this protein. And then if you're smart about this, you put a little hist tag on the end of the protein. This is four histidines, which happens to bind to nickel very readily. So when you're done making this protein, you can bind it to a nickel column, rinse it off, and hopefully still have active peptide when you, when, when you come off this, this, this process. Doesn't always work perfectly because the tag sometimes alters the protein. Sometimes the E. coli uh, glycosylates the protein differently than you'd expect uh, in the plant. Sometimes it doesn't fold correctly uh, in the plant. So it's a bit of a gamble, and we got quite lucky on this gamble. After we um, got this cloned and expressed, we took the protein and started putting it through beta-glucanase assays. These are assays that, that uh, have a fluorescently labeled uh, insoluble beta-glucan molecule that after it's digested, it's soluble. So you can monitor the digestion capacity of a thaumatine-like protein by putting it through this assay for a set period of time. You put a little bit of enzyme in there, and if it's good at doing its job, it will chew up that insoluble glucan that's, flore that's fluorescently labeled, and the, the fluorescent molecules that come off that, that digestion process are now smaller sugar units, and now they're soluble. So you can then spin down the insoluble fraction and then measure the absorption that's in the supernate, and you get a measurement as to how active your enzyme is. Well. We have some activity from the enzyme that came out on beta-glucan. That's, that's very exciting. And we've been comparing this TLP enzyme to some other um, uh, chitinases and, um, I'm sorry, chitinases and some other um, enzymes from a snail, actually. The snail one is, uh, is quite active. Um, you can see some of that repeated over here. We're playing around with uh, TLP that came out of the inclusion bodies of E. coli versus ones that are cytoplasmic versus um, a couple of the other of the other blanks, and we, what we want to see is that there is high signal here. This is the um, 
the positive control is what happens if it's perfect. And you want the signal to almost reach the positive control. All right, so um, we're getting the most expression from TLP here and from here. This one went through dialysis to change the, the buffer. Uh, but when you apply these on to plants, what you want to look for are, now here, here are the Jamaican lion plants that have the enzymes natively expressed, and they're not getting powdery mildew despite having been placed it's in, a, in, a, in a tent surrounded by this guy who has it all over him. And it doesn't seem to transfer, even if you take them and, and, and put, the, put the, uh, the leaves side by side, we don't get a transfer. There are transfer protocols described by Dr. Punja. Uh, he has some protocols with a certain amount of humidity. You put these and you should get transfer from, from one to the other. Um, now, the other thing we do outside of these assays is we grow some of the endophytes from the plant um, on actual petri dishes. Now, we couldn't do that with powdery mildew, um, powdery mildew over here because powdery mildew is not, it's an obligate biotrope. There's no way to culture it other than on a leaf. So um, we are working on foliar sprays and we do have some photographs of applying this um, to the plant. And there does seem to be some decay of the, um, of the powdery mildew when you put enzyme on these. I don't have those photographs in this presentation, but they'll, they'll be posted. They've been posted online before. Um, but what you're looking for is you, you take this technique where you put these tabs of Wattman paper, you have to sterilize them, of course, right next to the colony as it grows out. And right as the colony begins to touch those tabs, you start adding in the amount of enzyme to see if, if the enzyme retards any growth. And here's the blank, which is the vehicle control that this enzyme's in, and it seems to not do much. 20 micros, microliters of TLP didn't seem to do much on its own. You add in a little bit of um, two different flavors of this enzyme, and you start to see it turn blue. And you put in a chitinase and a TLP in here, and you can really see an impact here, this line of blue and the cheese. Uh, this is a type of um, penicillin that you find in blue cheese, and you can see it starts to give you that cheese-like look where the blue is starting to change color. Uh, and there's and there's an indentation on its on its growth in advance. Well, we did the same thing with fusarium uh, and aspergillus, and the aspergillus didn't seem to make a big dent, but we only did it with the TLP. We're trying to get more chitinase, so we do it with both, and we'll see if the the cannabis chitinase actually fights fights it back a little bit better. But with fusarium, what you can see here um, is that. In the high and the medium side of this experiment, we're getting all types of disruption of growth. In fact, the pigment is changing. This this discoloration in, in pigment has been published before. When you add um, uh, any type of uh, uh, mitocide on here that or mycocide that might actually kill fungi, the autofusarin expression turns off in fusarium, and so you lose the pink pigment as you're starting to kill it. Um, so that's a great assay to show you that the, the enzymes actually have some functionality. So we think we've got a good model for powdery mildew resistance in Jamaican lion. Uh, we don't believe that we've nailed powdery mildew resistance for all cultivars because when you see this many genes involved in pathogen response, there's probably you know a dozen different ways to skin the cat. And there's probably convergent evolution where we see other plants have copy number amplifications of other proteins that we're not paying attention to or... Um, that just aren't um, necessarily amplified in Jamaican lion, and those may in fact be another source of powdery mildew resistance in other plants. So we can't claim that this is the powdery mildew, powdery, powdery mildew resistance gene for all of cannabis. I don't think that will be the case. I think we're going to find multiple different modes of, of resistance as we go forward. Nevertheless, we do have tools that can help monitor this while you're breeding to know whether your relative number of genes is going up or down in the process of breeding. You certainly don't want to breed yourself into a corner where you're missing um, some of these genes. Now, I do want to go back um, to tell you why that's important. This area here in the cannabinoid synthase map here, where you see full-blown deletions for a very large section of the genome, this is actually the cannabichromine cluster, okay? There are eight cannabichromine genes in here. Um, it's labeled as inactive THC synthase in, um, in, in, in NCBI, and that's because when they first discovered this, they noticed it didn't make a whole lot of THC, but it, we, it's believed that it could leak some. If you take these genes, CBD, THC, and CBC, and you clone them into yeast and feed them precursor under different conditions, they will promiscuously make multiple cannabinoids. Each enzyme itself is not a pure chemical reaction, okay? Uh, it has off-target effects. THC synthase can make a little CBD synthase. CBD synthase can make a little THC synthase. And CBC is believed to be able to make both the others as well, although it's less documented. Um, so what else is carried along in this deletion? Well, this deletion also carries on. It's Contig 756 down here. And you can see anything labeled with Contig 756 that's blue is in that deletion. And these genes happen to be NIP1, TPS1, PIP1, 
uh, NPF1, RMT. And SPAP, these genes are all involved in pathogen resp response, okay? One of them is an aquaporin receptor. The other one is like a gibberellin receptor, all right? This, this is stuff we can't like... Uh, and these are important genes that are really close to the cannabinoid, um, the cannabichromine cluster. And you can see the deletion has a variable stop point for each one of these cultivars. Not all of them have the deletion stopping at the same point. So um, there's some heterogeneity in the, in the three prime end of this deletion that you might want to track because uh, it's very easy for you to breed for a cannabichromine deleted plant if you want to lower some THC levels in maybe your type three plants. You just search for one that doesn't have this and cross it. And if it's a type three plant and you cross to cross, you'll be okay. You'll notice a lot of the type three plants in here actually have the CBC. So a really easy thing to do is maybe cross it with some type twos that don't uh, and see if you can lower your THC levels. Notice a lot of type ones have it as well. Not all of them, but a lot. some of them have at least half, but these guys have a have two copies of cannabichromine synthase or, or, or kind of train wreck. And I think the other one is Citrix or Black 84. Um, so there, we see them more in uh, in the hemp lines than in necessarily the THC lines, but these full-blown deletions are, homozygous deletions are really a, a sight to see. Um, this is another reason why naming the actual chromosomes is going to get delayed, because a 2 megabase deletion of this size would confuse you as to whether you were chrom chromosome 5 or chromosome 6. The chromosomes are usually numbered by, uh, by size, okay? If one of your chromosomes happens to have a 2 megabase deletion, well, it's going to confuse you as to whether it's um, a chromosome of similar size. Okay, so pathogen response in cannabinoids, these are important gene copy number events to monitor in your plants. I'd, I'd recommend you sequence your parent line so you know what you have, and then um, you can probably aluminum sequence uh, and even maybe do panel sequencing or SNP chips on the offspring to lower costs, um, but you probably want your parents... Uh, done whole genome scale so you know what you're dealing with and you know what, what cards you've been dealt. Okay, now let's get on to the real hairy part of the presentation. So um, one thing you can do with these very long reads is you can begin to ask between the trio, how many structural variations do I have? How many times do I have a long read from the sibling or from the offspring that looked like looks like it's got a large deletion or a large insertion in it? These are called uh, structural variants. Now, structural variants sometimes can also be uh, a little bit different than a copy number variant, although a copy number variant is a subclass of a structural variation. Copy number events tend to increase or decrease the copy number of the DNA. There are such things as balanced translocations and, 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 and inversions in the genome where you, you know two chromosome tips swap. Copy hasn't changed, but their structure has. Uh, you know, same thing is true with uh, a balanced deletion or an inversion where something just flips on you. Copy number hasn't changed, but it's order and orientation in the genome has, okay? Those tend to, structural variants are a larger class where CNVs are just a subset of them, all right? So when we do this, we see 17,000 uh, heterozygous deletions and 9,000 homozygous deletions uh, in the male flower and, and the offspring has even more. Um, so this is actually a tremendous amount of variation that we're seeing. Uh, in fact, it looks to be like it's over an eighth of the genome and includes some Bosco genes. All right, so if there is this much structural variation going on in an inbred trio, now granted, um, I think this might be an extreme case, even though it's an inbred trio. I think the selection of the runt has caused some of this, um, that this thing was probably an unstable genome. And so we have a really high structural variation map right now. But um, it's quite surprising that it can happen in just a matter of 12 seeds. One of them's a runt, and we have all the structural variation. That's, that's quite remarkable. Likewise, all of the Illumina data on the other 40 genomes supports lots of copy number variation. So it kind of implies this isn't really unique to our situation here, that there is, in fact, a lot of genome plasticity in cannabis. Uh, to give you some perspective, the human genomes have like seven events per megabase um, in SV, and uh, they have maybe a similar number of events, but they tend to be much smaller. They're only 1% of the genome, all right? We're, we're upwards to 12% of the genome. So this is a much harder problem in cannabis than human. Now, um, so that makes you think, how can you pick a single reference? Well, you really can't, but if you're forced to pick a single reference, there are some criteria that you should think about in picking them. 
Um, at the moment, if you go to NCBI, it will probably graduate um, anyone who's dared call chromosomes in cannabis. And a couple people have tried, and as a result, the three genomes that are in there, none of them agree on the chromosome nomenclature. All right, and I'm not surprised. That's because I think there's still some chromosome misassemblies that are going on, but there's also probably lots of structural variation between the biological samples that make these things very difficult to discern one chromosome from the other. So uh, eventually we'll be no getting the nomenclature right in these based on what genes are what tend to be in which chromosomes and probably not stick, uh, get, get so hung up on the size. But um, at the moment, we've got a bit of a chromosome mess um, going on in there. Now, in light of that, um, the chromosome scaffolding information doesn't really hold a lot of quality information. When you take contigs and you link them together with linkage maps, you don't have a real quality score on what is that scaffold made of. It's just an association that we think this contig is next to this one, but you can't put a probability on it, right? Whereas the, the, the sequencing information itself, you have quality scores at every single base that you can put a probability of correctness on. So that's the underlying data that's most important, and you want to make sure that that data is the most contiguous as possible. Uh, you can easily play some shell games in sequencing where you report really large scaffolding and 50s, but they're based on chromosome or on contigs that are externally small, and those tend to be very poor, poorly constructed genomes. Okay, the other thing you want to look at are the BUSCO scores. You want to make sure those are as high as possible. You also want to look at how much depth of coverage the genomes has. And as we've shown you, um, we, we tend to have much higher coverage than anyone who's ever made a stab at this before. 100 to 200x coverage is not traditionally getting done. So there is, uh, there's much, far more raw sequence data on, um, on Jamaican wine than there is on, on anything else that's in there. Okay. Um, we also have some some high C data that we can use to call chromosomes. However, when we've done that, we've just realized that our chromosomes disagree with theirs as well, and so we're, we've got the problem of the fourth watchman, where we're not adding any more um, we're not adding any more uh, contiguity necessary to the equation. We're just adding more confusion. So we've opted not to put that data public until we get it done on a couple different technologies, so that we can really confidently call what the chromosomes are in, in, in Jamaican lion. And they still might be different than what we find in the other lines, just due to biological diversity. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we don't want to add to the chromosome confusion at the moment. So, okay, what are the other things that are key to making a gold standard reference? Well, you want to get both a male and a female genome um, sequenced because we just showed you the male, the, the Y chromosomes, the largest chromosomes. So you've got to have a Y in your reference, all right? The other thing you want to do is get a trio because you need to, to train your genotypers. Right now, the genotyping software out there has all been written for human, which is expecting a variant every 1,000 bases. And we happen to have a variant every 50 bases in cannabis. And those genotyping tools all need to be retrained. And the way that you retrain them is to sequence a mother, father, and an offspring, what's known as a trio, so that you can segregate sequencing errors and confirm whether or not they exist in the parents. If a sequencing error is found in one line and doesn't exist in the parents, it doesn't pass a Mendel check. That makes no biological sense. You flag it as an error, and now you can count your errors versus all the genotypes that you have that have Mendelian concordance between the parents. This Mendel check thing is very important for, for gauging genotyping accuracy, and it's only been done to date on Jamaican line. Okay, the other thing you want is a type two plant. Something that has both THC and CBD genes in this. You don't you do not want a type three plant as a reference because if you sequence a genome for a client and you map it to a reference that doesn't have THC synthase and you fail to detect that their plant could potentially make THC synthase, then the criminal negligence charges that the USDA might throw at the grower are going to roll uphill to you. So no sequence provider, chip manufacturer, or or, or um, tool provider in the space wants to touch a reference that doesn't have THC synthesis in it because they have to be able to detect whether the reference has that. That's probably the number one thing in cannabis you gotta detect given there's criminal negligence for 0.5% THC or higher. Gotta have THC. Um, as I mentioned before, you want the longest reads, the most recent chemistry, the deepest coverage, uh, and we've got that with SQL2 and with HiFi data. We're the only one who's done a cannabis genome on HiFi data. The data is already public, You're free to use it. Um, you also want to get your RNA annotation from the same genome that you assembled. Many of the other genomes out there are taking RNA sequencing from other plants and applying it to theirs to call the genes. That's noisier. You get all the different, you get different SNPs involved, you get different structural variations involved, and it's harder to do gene annotation with a different organisms uh, or different plants' RNA. You got, it's really much better to get it from the, the, the plant 
that you sequence the genome from, and we have that with Jamaican lion. We've got methylation information, and on top of that, more cannabis data is mapped to Jamaican lion than any other cultivar. There are 47 whole genome shotguns now in the Koji genome browser with BAM files. That's after mapping, so you don't have to remap the data. And we've also loaded over 50 strain seeks in there, and there's another 300 on their way. Um, so um, this has two genomes that are certified in Koji, the male and the father, uh, or the, the I'm sorry, the mother and the father, um, and uh, the offspring's up there as well. So there's a trio up there in, in Koji for you to work with. Okay, now let's go beyond this. Let's actually take this to um, doing better assemblies. Um, so since we put all this data out, this is stepping into stuff that we haven't completely published yet. Although the data is public for you to use, it's not been put into paper yet. Um, this is what's known as a can assemblathon. Um, something happened uh, this year that was a bit of a, a paradigm shift in DNA sequencing. All right, PacBio um, finally got the read lengths out to 180 kb, which meant that they could lap a 20 kb molecule nine times, and in doing so, they can get Q30 data on 20 kb molecules. No one's ever had that before, and that completely changes the way that you write DNA assemblers. And so all the leading DNA assembly people in the world realized this and immediately rewrote their assemblers. Three new assemblers came out this year. We have something called High ASM from Hang Lee at the Broad. He's one of the more prominent um, software uh, authors for a lot of the stuff in the field. Uh, he wrote a BWA and a variety of great tools. Um, Sergi Corin wrote Canoe which is a, one of the more popular DNA assemblers out there. He rewrote that specifically to handle PacBio's new data for him because he was so excited about it. Great conception at, at um, PacBio has also um, re-rigged Fal the Falcon Assembler to better handle this data. And Jason Chin, who was a former author of the Falcon Assembler, rewrote an algorithm altogether called the Peregrine Assembler that takes a completely different assembly approach knowing it has accurate data. And you're going to see some of that. It's, it's quite remarkable. So what you're seeing here is just different stringency is applied in the assembly to try to phase the genome. You can start to peel the mother and the, when you do an assembly like this, all of the reads from your genome get assembled and your mother and father reads sometimes for the same chromosome get stuck together, they get collapsed. And the job at the end of assembly is to phase those or split them apart into mother and father lines. And that can be challenging if the mother and the father genome are so similar that they don't, there's no differences upon which to split them. Or, or if they're hyper polymorphic, they easily separate into two unique pieces of sequence. All right. So in order to do this, you set different stringencies of uh, of, 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 of the, this is called the minimum percent identity uh, to actually purge and split these haplotags. And this is just Greg doing eight different or what was it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different assemblies on Falcon. Uh, there's a ton of compute power put into this slide um, to give us. Um, different types of assemblies. You can see some of the ones like the 99.9% .9 purged are giving us 6 meg and 50s. Uh, and um, you can measure the amount of duplicated genes that you see in the BUSCO um, score to, to get a, a sense of how well you're purging a lot of these genes and how well you're splitting the assembly. Um, but anyway, uh, this was all done on what is known as HiFi. This is the latest chemistry from PacBio. We got early access to it and they uh, did a single flow cell and got 400 giga sequence out of a single flow cell, 180 kb and 50 reads, and we gave it 20 kb molecules, so we got 30 gig of CCS data. This is about 30x coverage across the genome. Um, now, what's different about this, is now that you have really accurate reads, you can play some games. You don't have to do an n squared assembly where you map every single read against every other read. You can do something that's known as a paired shimmering approach, which I'll leave you to go to Jason Chin's work on the paragon assemblers to how this thing works. But because this algorithm scales not n squared, but n times the coverage squared, you can actually pull this off in a home computer. So I was able to assemble this genome on my home computer in seven hours. I've never been able to assemble a cannabis genome on a home computer. Uh, he pulled it off in much in much less time. He's got a better computer than I do. Um, here's here's an example: 30 gig going in. Um, this is HiFi data again. This is the most recent Pack Bio data off of their SQL two. He assembles this in uh, in 71 minutes. Ends up with uh, a record breaking uh, four megabase and uh, and 50. It's the best one we've ever seen to date. Um, and he tunes it a little bit further and, pu and pushes it out to eight megabase with busco scores over 97%, 71 minute assembly, all right? This is a remarkable time to assemble. No normally these things take a week or two on a 500 CPU cluster with a terabase of RAM, all right? This is a hundred to a thousand fold faster 
what we're doing right now. And from a CPU standpoint, uh, I think it's actually a thousand times faster from a CPU standpoint because the the um, the high canoe assemblies took 4,000 CPU hours, and this one was, I'm sorry, it's 100 fold. It's 100 fold faster. But it being 100 fold faster means we can actually de novo assemble these genomes faster than we can map 200 million reads to them. This, so this changes the way that you think about genomics. If the, if the assembly of a cannabis genome is now computationally more effective with PacBio than mapping 200 million short reads to the genome, you start to switch plans. You, send, you basically do de novo assembly in your parents so you don't have to worry about structural variants. You can get all those nailed and then you can illuminate map to your references. You make your own personal references for your parents. We can help you do that. Um, and that way, um, you're not playing a guessing game with what genes are there and what genes aren't there. Okay, well, the other thing that popped out of this was the CBD and THC in one contig. That's never happened before. That's kind of cool. Um, you can see them scattered. This is the dot plot. So this is the repeat pattern that's around these genes, and it's absolutely remarkable. It's like this crazy fractal um, that you see. And, um, in fact, here's another view of it. Oh, uh, here's another view of it. You've got all of this different uh, re repetitive material right as you come through this um, region. There's five copies in one contig and, and four in the other. Um, so totally phased across many, many megabases. We've got them both uh, together now. We know their distance. Um, that's pretty cool. That's never happened before. Um, now, that being said, like I mentioned before, um, you probably don't know who these artists are if you're not of a certain age, but this here is Millie Vanilli, uh, who are busted for lip syncing. And that's kind of what read mapping is, and we've tolerated it in genomics because it was so affordable and cheap. But now that the price of long reads are coming down and you can get large reads, you really should just move on and do de novo when you can, at least on your parents, all right? Uh, so we want to be like this guy who, from the looks of his eyes, is probably into cannabis. Um, but these, this is the math here on the assembly time. Uh, since you have 20 KB reads, you only need 1.5 million of them. And since you have more accurate data, you really only need like 15x coverage, but we did 30. Um, this ends up being a much, sim much smaller number uh, than taking 200 million reads uh, and having to deal with 60x coverage. You need more coverage for the shorter reads. Uh, you end up having to deal with a lot more computation this way. So fewer reads to map, and the fact that we're not doing an n squared algorithm here, if this were n squared, it'd be, it'd be 200 million times 200 million. That's a lot of computation. Uh, or 1.5 million times 1, 1. 1.5 million. Still a lot of computation. It's really only the square of the coverage that we're dealing with, which is a much, much smaller number when you use this Peregrine approach. It's still early with Peregrine, and we're testing it out. Um, the other thing, uh, one of the other assemblers that Sergi Korn updated was called um, High Canoe. High Canoe is... Uh, uh, one of the more popular assemblers now. And the remarkable thing about High Canoe is it pumped out a 5.2 megabase uh, assembly in this assemblathon uh, and a 97.4% Busco score, which is remarkable. But the thing that gives us the most faith that this is probably the best genome ever assembled for cannabis is that the telomeres are perfectly resolved. Telomeres are the end of chromosomes that have like the same sequence for very long stretches. In fact, you can see this repeating pattern down here and it goes on for one and a half KB here, 3 KB, 4 KB, 5 KB, 7 KB, and it doesn't end. It ramps all the way out to 26 KB, 43 KB. I mean, I've never seen a 43 KB repeat before in my life because sequencers just couldn't read them. It's, it's really remarkable. And the fact that we have 17 of these now means that the, the, in the first attempt, the genome sent out, a pro we should have gotten about 20 chromosome telomeres. The fact that three of them are collapsed is going to be probably pretty easy for us to resolve. What you'll see is there are subtle differences in these telomeres and what they link to is different. So you can get a 20 KB read coming in here um, that bridges out here and has one or two snips in the telomere and you can link another high quality read to it and extend it. And this is how we're getting out to some of these 43 KB telomeres. Um, now, why am I so excited about telomeres? There's not a lot of biological information in there. I mean, the molecular clock is probably in there. Your clones are probably getting shorter and shorter telomeres as you age. Um, but the reason why we're so excited about seeing telomeres is that when you get perfect telomere assemblies, it's usually a sign that the repeats internal to your genome are all resolved perfectly as well. Um, because they're more divergent than telomeres. Telomeres are a simple sequence repeat that goes on for a long period of time. They're very difficult to discern. They usually are assembly knots. In fact, when we look at a lot of the genomes in NCBI right now, they're, they don't have telomeres. 
you do see some internal telomeric sequences, which makes you think some of the some of the chromosomes might actually be inappropriately fused together. Uh, so you get a telomere sequence in the middle. You can find that. That's also naturally found in plants, so you don't really know what to do with that information. But uh, when you have assemblies that pop out beautiful telomeres like this, you have much more confidence that the rest of the genome has its repeats in order as well. All right, now what do you do with all this information? Well, what we've been doing with this information is designing really good QP qPCR assays to pick up yeast and mold. And many people skip this step. They don't bother sequencing the host genome, and this is the pain they have. Here's a group that made a microarray system where they put all these primers in the microarray and everything in yellow hits cannabis. So they didn't bother to, they didn't bother to scan cannabis references as to whether or not the primers were gonna hybridize to it. Imager calibration, negative control hits it, all right? Aspergillus flavus, Niger, these things have some homology. Now it's not the whole probe, but it's long enough of a sequence of the probe to probably interfere a little bit. Some of the PCR primers that amplify the material have these problems too. They filed six patents in 2018 on this. Um, they since told us that they no longer use these primers. So they, they spent more money on attorneys making bogus patents than they could have spent on sequencing the genome. Um, likewise, uh, you can look at another set of primers that came out of um, a group in Europe. Uh, and this group is pivoting also into the space in the food industry where they've never had to worry about a cannabis background and are just kind of arrogantly plowing in, assuming they don't have problems. And lo and behold, you sequence some of the amplicons that come off of their total yeast and mold primers. And what do you hit? You hit cannabis 28S ribosomal DNA. Well, that's not going to work. That means there are cannabis plants out there that your primers amplify and you're always going to be failing someone for some level of yeast and mold. These are also polymorphic, so they may get amplification on some cannabis and not other strains. So you might get some strains that just look like it works on and you get you always get mold on, and other ones you don't, and you blame it on the plant as always having mold, but really you just have some SNPs in your in your 28S and 26S ribosomal regions, and um, it appears as if the plant always has mold when it doesn't. The other thing you shouldn't hit with yeast and mold primers are insects. This insect in particular is a spider mite. Uh, so uh, if your primers hit spider mites, you're going to fail a lot of stuff that doesn't have mold, that you think has mold because it's hitting spider mites. Spider mites are gross. I don't want them on cannabis either, but your test should be accurate. It shouldn't hit stuff. If, if it hits insects, God knows what else it hits, uh, right? It's going to fail for a lot of other material that's not on the fail list. Um, now with this, we can also go through Canopedia. Um, I already have some videos on Canopedia, so I'm going to plow through this because you can review some of the Canopedia information in the Canopedia tutorial. Uh, but I do want to point uh, out this promiscuous DNA uh, or, 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 or THC synthase thing that's going on here. Here's a type 4 plant. Um, THC CBD knockout still has THC, still has THCA, still has cannabichromine. We don't have the sequence of this plant, but I wouldn't be surprised if this has a cannabichromine cluster and might be leaking. It doesn't have a CBD gene, so this THC is not coming from CBD synthase. None detected. Uh, all right, so that's why you want to be paying attention to uh, what types of genes you have in your genome. Um, and also read this paper. Uh, Zerbel's a great paper where they clone these genes and they demonstrate they can make different cannabinoids under different conditions. And they actually chart out all the different point mutations in the gene that start to change these ratios. We track those in uh, those types of variants in, in, in Canopedia. Uh, and this is um, what you want to look for. This is a variation map across THC synthase. And here's one across CBD synthase. Um, never mind this. This is a, an error that the thing burped up in annotation. It doesn't actually have X, uh, introns in, in CBD synthase. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, these are all the different SNPs that we found. And those SNPs you want to do is correlate them with the ones that they found as causing a decrease in function. And that may help your breeding program. Um, now, our current strain seek panel does in fact hit CBD synthase. Or, I'm sorry, CBC synthase. It also hits CBD and THC synthase. This is 323 different strain seq samples. This is the sequencing coverage across them. You can see it craters down here on the samples that are cannabichromine negative. And if you pull some of these out of Canopedia, you'll see they don't make any cannabichromine down here. They're cannabichromine negative plants. Um, that's a good sign. That means that CBD synthase, which it is making, isn't making off-target cannabichromine. Not that it would matter, but um, you know, it's just nice to know that, that um, there's some specificity there in one direction. Um, Anyway, we use this to track uh, people, so you don't have to sequence an entire genome to get to this answer. We can help you breed the cannabinoids with uh, just a panel. Um, it's a little bit cheaper that way. 
but um, contact us if you're interested in there. If you do get your data sequenced with us, there's a wealth of data you can compare it to. We have four terabases of sequence in a public genome browser that you can load your data in and view it and annotate it privately uh, against the backdrop of all that public data. And it's great information like this in here. This is actually what you're looking at are the different exons that you're seeing there in pink with the lines connecting them. And so you can actually look at alternative splice signals that you have. Um, they're not really any present here, maybe that one. Um, but uh, you can see the different RNA that's getting expressed in different regions of the genome and, and uh, it gives you information on, on how much you actually have per tissue, which is kind of informative. And you can make other um, tools. We do have a 16 SNP panel that you can use to do seed to cell tracking with. It gives you enough, sort of, enough, enough information um, that you can pin down a strain in a, in a gross ballpark, and this actually feeds right into Canopedia because we have 6,500 SNPs in there across all of the strains that we aggressively monitor, and these 16 key into that so that we can plug into Canopedia from here, uh, and we can also read the BTBD allele and the XY marker off that assay. We're building virus assays. Uh, we're playing around with some other expression assays as well, uh, but all of this is predicated on having a really good reference. Um, on top, to top that off, uh, we do have five color aspergillus assays now. So Niger, Terius, Slavis, and Fumigatus are all done in different wavelengths in one single tube with a fifth color for the cannabis control. There's more enzyme, the kits are more sensitive than before, and we have them worked, working out um, with, uh, some of these can work out with uh, a live dead assay. You just have to be careful what channel you put the control for the live dead assay in. Um, but anyway, this is, a, this is a new kit that's out that greatly simplifies aspergillus testing in the field, and we know our primers don't have hit all these other extraneous places in the genome because we've got more genome sequence than anybody else. We know how to make primers as a result of that, and that means you can make primers that do this. This is a beautiful sight to see. You take your primers, apply them against all these different organisms, and demonstrate that they do not hit off target. That is really key. So our aspergillus, all four of our assays have been screened against all of these organisms. This is part of an AOAC inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, and we're in an AOAC process of validating this now. All these people help pull this off, takes a village. Um, it is really an honor to work with a lot of them. Um, they have uh, been, they've been just tremendous aides and, and uh, get it. It's, it's just diverse. It's diversity in terms of the, the expertise you have here. Experts in GPUs with people who know about methylation enzymes and single molecule sequencing and even some blockchains. It really leads to a, kind of a fun day at work every day. So, um, And then these people uh, directly have been contributing to various aspects of the project. Um, a lot of the folks here at Medicinal Genomics have put in long hours making all this stuff work uh, with that crazy grant structure we had. And, um, and Dash has been uh, you know, a great partner in funding all this. Uh, and then all these folks as well who have, who have chipped in over the years. So uh, thank you, and hopefully uh, that is within time.